Hi, I'm Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. I want to talk to you today about remembering who and what we are. Remembering who and what we are. This has been a stressful week. It's been a stressful week in a really stressful year. There's no question about that. And wherever you stand politically, whether today you are happy and excited with the election results or whether you are struggling, and as I said earlier, even in our unity family, we have people of very different mindsets politically. And so it's important for us to recognize that. It's important for us to, to acknowledge that no matter where we are within the political framework, this has been a difficult time for all of us. And it's a time, I think, that it is imperative that we step back and that we remember who and what we are, who and what we stand for, for spiritually. The Unity Center's mission is built upon two very important, equally important aspects. Those two aspects are transforming lives and healing our world. And doing both of those with love, transforming our individual lives with love and healing our world with love. And how important it is for us to realize that that is a mission and a purpose that we stand by, not just in easy times, but in all times. It's a mission and a purpose that we stand by, and to the very best of our ability, we try to live from in a very practical way. Not just when we are in our sanctuary, not just when we are connected virtually on Sunday mornings, but when we're living in the nitty-gritty of life itself, both in our families and personally, and in our country. The world's eyes have been on us throughout this whole election cycle, and especially throughout these last couple of weeks. And we, as citizens of this great country, have an opportunity and, I think, an obligation to stand up and to show who we are in our humanness and in our spirituality. We are here in unity to transform lives and to heal our world. And unity has always been a positive path for spiritual living. For nearly 150 years now, a positive path for spiritual living. Our very name, our very name, stands for what we stand for, unity. Unity, not sameness. Unity doesn't mean sameness. Unity means inclusion. Unity means that we are one. Unity has always emphasized our transformation individually and collectively through spiritual education and through, through spiritual practice. We stand in the realization that we have to do our own inner work, and sometimes that inner work is kind of messy and painful and difficult. But in order to be the, the expression of the divine that we are to the fullest extent, we have to do our inner work. But it cannot stop there. It cannot just be about us getting our individual act together and our individual lives working. It's got to be both and, that we work on ourselves and we also work to bring forth heaven on earth. It's not some distant place. It is something we are going to either choose to co-create together here in real time or not. Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, saw, saw Unity as an educational link. This is the way he described it. Unity is a link in the great educational movement inaugurated by Jesus Christ. Our objective is to discern the truth in Christianity and to prove it, to discern it, to understand the truth, not the theological stuff, but the spiritual principles, the spiritual truth, and to prove it by living from it. Unity has long recognized Jesus as a teacher of consciousness. 
teaching the, the consciousness of, of, of love, of agape love, a love that is unconditional, a love that leaves no one out. He was a teacher of prayer. And if you really look at the Lord's Prayer, what we've come to call in Christianity, what we've come to call the Lord's Prayer, it's really a series of affirmations. He taught affirmative prayer. He taught consciousness. He taught that we transform our lives through forgiveness, that we transform our lives through giving, that we transform our lives through serving. Think about who he interacted with, right? He was not just about a teacher of consciousness. He was about reforming the world in which he lived in. These spiritual teachings that, that are the heart and soul of unity, and the heart and soul, really, I think, of all the world's religious traditions, love and prayer and kindness and service and forgiveness and giving, these are all part of all of the world's spiritual traditions. And when we practice them, we do transform our lives. We, we've, we've seen in unity through all of our practices, we've seen physical healings that defy what doctors say is possible. We have that in our co-founders, in Charles and Myrtle's physical healing. I won't go into that here and now, but through these practices, they healed their bodies. We see through these practices, these spiritual practices, relationships being mended, we see lives of meaning and purpose being crafted. We see answers to big, big problems coming forward with ease and grace. We see abundance being created. So the principles work. The principles work, as they say in AA, if we work them, if we work them. But Jesus was not only a teacher of consciousness. Jesus was a teacher, a transformer, a reformer. He stood for looking at the world that he lived in and seeing what wasn't working, seeing where there was injustice, seeing where there was division, seeing where, where there was a lack of understanding or a lack of humanity, and calling it out, not remaining silent about it. I mean, it got him in trouble, big trouble. But he saw it and he named it and he attempted to do what he could to change it. He was socially responsive. He was socially responsive and socially engaged. I don't understand how anyone who calls themselves a Christian or a metaphysical Christian or a spiritual person can, can separate one spiritual practice from engaging with the very real issues in the world. I believe we have to start looking at the issues, the social issues in the world today. We've got to lift them up and look at them spiritually. They are not political issues. They are human issues. They are human issues. We need to look at each other through the eyes of love. We need to stand for what is going to bring us together and heal us. We have a heck of a lot of work to do right now in our country. But I believe that we can do it. I believe we have to do it. And I believe that just as much of the world has looked to us in the past for inspiration, that we are being looked at right now to see how we come through this time whether we can come through this time saying, yeah, we got really nasty with one another. Yeah, we really are a deeply divided country. But you know what? We've got to stand for something that's bigger than that division. And this is where our spiritual practice really does have to come in. We are so torn apart. We have to heal that. And we can't ignore it. Have you ever noticed what happens if you have a wound and you ignore it, you don't clean it out. You don't deal with getting all the infection and the gunk out. That if you don't, it doesn't just go away by itself. And it gets worse when we ignore it, right? For it to be healed, we have to clean it. And we've got some cleanup work to do all around us. 
It's not cleanup that's just one political party, but not the other. It is all of us that have to be called up and into a greater embodiment of our spiritual practice and teachings so that each of us can do the part that we can do and must do to bring about a true sense of healing. I've been listening to the book Cast, and I was taken by this statement in it. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. It's time we face what we'd rather not see. Well, you know what? This whole year has brought up a lot of stuff that's been underneath the surface for a very, very long time, and it's not pretty stuff. We've seen on all sides some pretty ugly ways of being, and we've been reminded in black and white, no pun intended, of the tremendous racial injustice that still exists in our country today. Let us not back away from the ugliness of that. Let us be willing to face it so that we can change it, so that we can heal it. I saw a short little video clip sometime this week that inspired me and demonstrated this idea of needing to be able to hold a bigger picture, a bigger frame around what is going on right now or what we have just come through. And it was a story, true story, of neighbors who live in a very divided town, some in the suburbs, somewhere in the Midwest, very divided, so much so that you could drive through this neighborhood and you would see a Trump sign, then you'd see a Biden sign, a Trump sign, a Trump sign, a Biden sign, a Biden sign. And the story was that one of the people who lived in this neighborhood had a Biden-Harris sign in his front yard. And he came home one day to find that that sign had been removed. But he also had his next-door neighbor who had a Trump sign in his front yard come out that very same day with a Biden sign that he put in his neighbor's yard. Now, it was clear that these two were going to vote very, very differently. But it was also clear that they stood for and they recognized something bigger than their political differences. What they stood for and what they recognized that is bigger than their political differences was that they both belonged to the same family. And that is the human family. And as simplistic as that might sound, it is the truth. And we have got to not demonize the other. I made it a point during this election cycle to listen to news from the other side, what for me is the other side. And I found that as I listened to it and I found how I and those on, quote, my side, I hate that word side, were being portrayed, I, I thought, wow, that's not at all who I am. But then as I listened to how my side portrayed the other side, and I thought about friends and colleagues that I have who are on the other side, I thought to myself, but that's not how they are either. That what we've been demonizing and what we've had broadcast to us are such extremes of these sides. And in that portrayal, it becomes so much harder to get out of the corners that we put ourselves in. But we've got to come out of those corners, and we've got to come into the light, and we've got to realize that we do have some very real problems in our country. Some of them we have ignored for a very long time, and though we want to say that they are political, I think the most real problems that we face are human problems, and that we have to remember first and foremost that we are in the same family. And we have to start acting like we are in the same family. I'm not suggesting that the path forward is easy. I don't think it is. But I know that unless we can stop demonizing each other, unless we are willing to really look, and unless we are willing to not just look, but to actually listen, and not just listen to those who are seeing things exactly the way we are, but as hard as it is to listen to those who see it very differently, and try to understand why do they see it so differently. 
in the anti-racism work that I've been leading for the last several years now, through the, the work and the trainings of Dr. David Camp, one of the things he taught, has taught us in, in racial equity work is how important it is when you are talking to someone who doesn't believe that racism still exists in the world or in our country today, that instead of citing other people's opinions or, or citing statistics, instead of trying to argue your point, that you first try to understand what is it in their personal lived life experiences that cause them to believe as they do. Because when we can listen at that level, we can begin to connect. And when we can begin to connect, we can begin to hold a bigger frame around the very real issues that have us so polarized. So together, somehow, we can find a way to bridge some of that gap and to find some common ground, because we're not going to make it if we don't. And we're not going to make it if we don't look there is nothing in our spiritual teaching or practice that says ignore the ugly or ignore the negative. But it does say don't stay stuck there. And it does say don't exclude anyone. And it does say listen. And listen with the ears of the heart. In our Unity Center here in San Diego, our mission and purpose, as I've said, is transforming lives and healing our world. And we try to do that through three core practices, through being spiritually progressive, and that's the easy part. Unity believes that there is one God called by many names and found through all the world's religions and traditions, that it doesn't matter what you call God, and it really doesn't matter what path you take, as long as you have some sort of understanding of the presence and power greater than you, and you use that understanding to live in a more loving and good way. So spiritually progressive, leaving no one out. We are radically inclusive, radically inclusive. In unity, we have never discriminated against a person because of what they look like or believe. Well, actually, we do have a little healing work we need to do as a movement. But as individual unity people, I think most of us have always been radically inclusive, not judging or marginalizing someone because of their race or their sexual orientation or any of the other isms that we are so prone sometimes to use. So radically inclusive. But here's a big one for some of us in unity. That radically inclusive also means including the other, pol other political spectrum, the other end, whatever is the other end of that political spectrum for you. And that is about what I've been speaking about, the listening the remembering that despite our very real differences, there's a reason we have those differences. There are lived experiences have, that have caused us to feel so strongly the way that we do. And in some, in some ways, those lived differences have to be acknowledged so they can be healed, so we can move forward and find that common ground. And so being spiritually progressive, being radically inclusive, and being socially responsive. And being socially responsive, as I said earlier, Jesus was socially responsive. What does it mean to be socially responsive? It means that we know what the issues are, that we take the time to be educated, not in sound bites from social media, but that we, we learn what the issues are so that we can find those issues that truly break our heart open and get to work to doing what we can do within those particular issues. I was inspired as my family and I were preparing to vote. As soon as our mail-in ballots came, we, we got them out and we started to read them. And I was so inspired by our young adult daughter, Jennifer. She's all of 24 or 25 years old. Moms forget that after a while. And I remember watching her night after night for a couple of weeks, spending hours researching each of the, the um, props on the ballot, really trying to understand, and sometimes those are very confusing, right? But taking the time, not reading a flyer that came in the mail, not just listening to mom and dad, but to actually do her own work. And I thought, this is what it is to be civically engaged. It is to say that 
I care enough about this human family, and I recognize that these issues, whether it's climate change or homelessness or the widening gap between those that have and those that have not, or racial discrimination, or the whole list, that it's not just enough to name it. We've got to be civically engaged and educated. And that takes some time. And that takes some time. But either we care or we don't care. And I refuse to believe that we don't care. Look at the number of people who came out in this election, unprecedented numbers, on both sides. And that's important, but you know what? If we think that just because that's done now, that, okay, we don't have anything more to do, we voted, we either got who we wanted, or we're not happy with who got elected, and we step back and we think, okay, I've done my part. That's not true. That's not true. We have to make a difference where we are in our local communities. And that is love in action when you think about it. That is love in action. And what all the world's religions share in common is love. And love is not just what you show your life partner or your children or your family. Love is not just what you show people who look like you. Love is not just what you do when it's easy. Love also is about getting into the issues and using the power of love to heal those issues. One of the things that I think is so very important and that helps us to be able to lift up these social issues and recognize them as human issues is to try to understand the underlying belief between them. Looking at the underlying belief that's created the conditions in the world today. What are the underlying beliefs that have cre allowed racism, systemic racism, to continue generation after generation? What are the underlying beliefs that have created the conditions of poverty, that have created the conditions of greed, that have created the conditions of homelessness. If we look deeply enough, we will find that it is beliefs in such things as separation and scarcity. If I believe in separation, if I believe in scarcity, then I'm going to have very different views about these issues in the world. But if we really are students of unity, then we believe that we are one. We believe in the all-sufficiency present in the universe as divine substance. And that means that we look at the solutions to the problems through though that lens, through the lens of our oneness, through the lens of enoughness. So take a breath with me. Because I think what we need to do right now I think what we need to do right now is to be about healing. If there is a relationship in your life, a work relationship, a friendship that has been damaged because of the political environment we've all been living under, then maybe that's where you begin doing your piece of healing. Maybe it's where you begin to listen, to not shut out. We need to catch our breath. We need to catch our breath. It's been a long haul, and not just because of the political environment. It's been a long haul for us with COVID, and we're not on the other side of that yet. We need to catch our breath. We need to reassess. Personally, we need to reassess. In our families, we need to reassess. And we sure as heck need to reassess in our country. And I think we need to refuse refuse to demonize the other. If you are one who is happy with the election results, I implore your better angels, don't walk about gloating that. Put your arm around the person who voted differently than you, literally or figuratively, because there's a reason that they believed the way they believed and acted the way that they acted, just as there is for your choice as well. And if we're really going to be about 
creating a world that works for everyone, leaving no one and nothing behind, then we're going to have to find a way to not demonize each other. We're going to have to find a way to remember that we really are, we really are, all in this together. And if COVID hasn't taught us that, I don't know what can. A couple of closing thoughts here. I've always been inspired by these words by Martin Luther King Jr. You have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. That we disagree, these are my words now, that we disagree is not nearly as damaging as the way we have demonized the other in our disagreements. That we disagree is not nearly as damaging as the way we have demonized the other in our disagreements. Let me close with an old Jewish story. It's a short story. It's the story that tells of a rabbi who asked his disciples, how do you know when the night is giving way and the morning is coming. One of his followers stood and said, Teacher, won't you know that night is fading when through the dim light you can see an animal and recognize whether it is a sheep or a dog? The rabbi answered, No. Rabbi, asked another, won't you know that the dawn is coming when you can see clearly enough to distinguish whether a tree is a fig tree or an olive tree? No, responded the rabbi. You'll know that the night has passed when you can look at any man and any woman and discern that you are looking at a brother or a sister. Until you can see with that clarity, the night will always be with us. We've been living through a very long night. It is time that we usher in a new dawn. Namaste.